Welcome to our video podcast today with two of the greatest figures in the history of the internet and technology. My name is Boris Feldman. I'm a lawyer at Freshfield Bruckhaus Derringer in Silicon Valley. And rather than taking time telling you about how great our guests are today, I'd like you to go online and look them up. One of them is Vint Cerf, who's one of the pioneers of the internet. The other is Whitfield Diffie, who was one of the pioneers in public key cryptography. And if you ever wonder when you're browsing and you see HTTPS, the S indicates that you're in a secure website and you owe that security to WIT. So we're going to talk to them today. Thank you very much for joining us. And we're going to take a look both backwards and forwards. We're going to talk about the things that have surprised you about developments in what you've created and perhaps disappointed. And then we're going to look to the future, both in terms of security on the internet and equally important, AI and what your hopes and fears are for it. And then we're going to close by asking you to provide some free career advice to younger people starting out today. Sounds so like a plan. Let, let me start with Vint Cerf. Can you tell us about the founding of the internet and your role in that? Well, the short story is that the Defense Department got very interested in uh, computer communication because it was supporting research in artificial intelligence in the 1960s. They were supporting about a dozen universities, and they wanted them to share uh, all of their results with each other. And everybody kept asking for a new computer every year, and DOD couldn't afford to do that for a dozen universities. So they said, we're going to build a network and everybody has to share. So they designed and built something called the ARPANET, the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network, and it actually worked out very well. The universities were all connected. They shared their software and their computing. So the Defense Department says, you know, this looks pretty good. Why don't we figure out if we can use computers in command and control? Well, if you're going to do that, then you have to think about the computers being in mobile vehicles, ships at sea, and aircraft, in addition to dedicated facilities that in, in air-conditioned rooms that were part of the ARPANET system. Robert Kahn, who worked on the ARPANET, went to ARPA and started this program, which eventually was called Interneting. And he and I, uh, while I was at Stanford University, sat down to figure out how do we connect the mobile packet radio network, the packet satellite network, the existing ARPANET, into a common multi-network system so that we can support computer communication in mobile vehicles, ships at sea, and aircraft? That was the internet problem. And in about six months, in 1973, <laughs> we figured out how to do that. We wrote a paper, which was later published in May of 1974 in IEEE Transactions on Communications. And then I continued to work on the program with my graduate students and then eventually went to ARPA to join Bob Kahn and ran the program for six years. So my job was basically to help give birth to this thing, which went operational on January 1st, 1983. So we had the 40th anniversary this year. That's correct. Years ago, I had the pleasure of representing you on the board of a company, and I told my kids that I was representing the inventor of the internet, Vint Surf, And they asked me, is that why we call it surfing the internet? <laughs> it, were they right? Well, not exactly. Uh, the term uh, was, was uh, given provenance uh, by Gene Armour Polly, who wrote a paper about surfing this information sea, the information ocean, so, and, but she spelled it S-U-R-F-I-N-G. It turns out that in San Diego, one of the uh, commercial network providers was um, developed in 1989 by General Atomics. And they were going to call themselves SURFNet because they were going to be hooking the universities in California together. And what else would you do when you're in San Diego anyway but surfing the net? Then they discovered that there was a, um, a, a surf uh, .net that was already in the Netherlands connecting Dutch universities together, so they couldn't use SurfNet. Somebody decided they could change the name 
to the California Educational Research Foundation Network, <laughs> spelled C-E-R-F-Net, and it sounded exactly the same. Then somebody said, well, maybe we should call Vint. So they called me up. And they said, uh, is it okay if we call this thing C-E-R-F-Net? And my first reaction was, if they screw it up, am I going to be embarrassed? And I thought some more about that, and I said, you know, People name their kids after other people, and if the kids don't come out right, they don't blame the people they name them after. So I said, sure, go ahead. So in July of 1989, I flew out to San Diego, and Susan Estrada, who was the executive director, and I took one of these plastic bottles of glitter, and we smashed it over a Cisco router, and we launched SurfNet. Perfect. Wit, how did... Wait a minute. I, I, I'm one of these awful interviewees who argues with the previous one. Please. And the only thing I want to argue with is, it can't have been a new idea in the 70s to use computers for command and control. It late sack at least to Sage, uh, which well, developed a lot of the technology we later used. Fair enough. Fair enough. Although Sage was primarily a distant early warning system. Uh, as opposed to a command Well, the term network. command and control came up in that era out of the uh, strategic air command control system. Uh, well, actually, uh, you know, if we're going to no, have no, this, this conversation, if we're going to have this, this, this is, you know, this is good to have this conversation. So there was another system that was specifically for command and control, and uh, that was a message switching system that the Defense Department built, which is independent of SAGE. SAGE was for distant early yeah. morning radar information. And the, um, uh, I'm not sure I remember the, the acronym for this, but they had a message switching capability before the ARPANET was built. So you're correct about that. Uh, but it was one of those uniform systems. And uh, in the case of ARPANET and later Internet, there was a lot of diversity among the computers that were. Involved. Yeah, no, I think the point, the point of your role in this is the inter part of it and the diversity of systems. And although I think, I think stages unquestionably was called command and control, distance has very little to do with SAGE. It's directly, radar is being able directly to tell computers how to tell aircraft Oh, no, no, do. no, no, no. Oh, yes, yes. yes. No, well, you and I will have to have this <laughs> debate outside. I don't believe that there was a control loop there. I think this was human beings tracking the radar information and then reporting if there was something coming over the pole. They wanted to make sure you distinguish. That's what the dew line did. Russian bombers. Well, yes, but the dew line data went to SAGE. That's the yeah, but that's, my, that's a decade later. I'm, I'm yeah. going to violate every rule of moderating. No, I'm going to jump to the end because this is the most important thing we're going to talk about today. The role of AI in control and command. And to what extent do you worry that when these fancy new artificial intelligence systems play an even greater role in the military than they do now? How much are you worried about civilizational risk? Civilization hasn't got, humans haven't got a chance. <laughs> humans are not going to be winning, running the world at the end of the century. And it won't involve any sort of a war. It's a very simple mechanism. People like to have things done for them. The more th the AI is offered to do things, people say sure. And at some point we'll look around and it'll be like not liking the government. There'll be nothing you can do about it. AIs will be running the world. And it's going to be more like 2050 than 2100. Do you share his optimism? Well, <laughs> right. So first of all, important reading assignment for the viewers. There is a book written by E.M. Forster. It's a novella right. in 1909 the called Stops. The Machine Stops. Yeah. That's right. And so the, the world that you were describing was imagined already in 1909 by E.M. Forster. The community lives in their homes. The, their food is delivered to them somehow. He doesn't explain the details. They communicate with each other through the machine. And so this society is like, kind of like during the pandemic. I mean, this was, this yeah, was, this a, was a story to read. I reread it during the pandemic. It's like, oh, that world has come to life. Exactly yes. right. So, of course, he posits in the early pages of the book that the machine stops. And so the question is, what happens to the civilization? So that's sort of assuming you go down which um, uh, train of thought, 
if we become dependent on the machine in the way that uh, you know, Forster's book has, then the question will be what happens when it stops working. Um, I am somewhat worried about our over-dependence on technology, partly for the reasons that Witt brings up, which is our willingness to be taken care of by automatic methods. Uh, I worry, for example, that nobody will know how to read a map anymore because they're expecting GPS to work on their mobiles. I even worry that people are extremely dependent now on mobiles, and if the, if the mobile doesn't work, there are cascade failures all over the place already, and that's only 2023. So I am a little worried about not just AI, I'm just worried about <laughs> software in general becoming both brittle and also unpredictable and heavily dependent on by our society. So it's, you know, these are kind of... And when negative. we look back from 2200, this will be the birth story of machine civilization. <laughs> All the problems it had. Wow. So if you were appointed the AI czar, at least in the U.S. I complained that I didn't have enough power. Yeah. <laughs> right, Was that electri just... electrical or otherwise? I was thinking political. You just got a brevet promotion to global AI czar. What would you do now at this turning point? Obviously invest more money in AI. <laughs> Even though you worry about it taking I over worry. everything. I don't worry. I simply think it's inevitable. Well, so let's, I, let, let's actually, as long as we're going to explore I this. Mean, uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me stir this pot a little bit more. When, you, when I say AI, is I mean things with immensely complex behavior. I think the objective we ought to have to do is start a project to develop something a billion times as intelligent as a human being. But whether it'll be done with silicon, or whether it'll be done by engineered biologicals, or whether it'll be done by something else that I don't foresee, I don't know. But it seems to me that we are in the process of giving the world giving birth to our children who will take care over the world. So this is an interesting, well, of course, children inevitably always take over the right, world. Right, exactly. Because we all die anyway, so, uh, so they're, you know. Well, I expect sort of, to die, but I don't think everybody alive today is going to die in any reasonable amount of time. Well, I'll bet there are people alive today who will be alive in a thousand years. We're, wow. We're going to come back to this. Okay. But on, on the issue uh, that Witt raised about controlling it. Do you see any way to control these developments in a positive way? Well, some of these things are being used in a constructive way. The problem is that we don't know when they are misbehaving or we can't predict that they're going to misbehave. So you get sometimes what sounds like very good advice and it turns out it isn't. Uh, these are the large language models and that's just, I think the large language models are just the beginning of a much more elaborate yeah. uh, kind of right. In intelligence. I, at the moment, what we have in the large language models, as I see it, is essentially the verisimilitude of human discourse. And I use that word on purpose yeah. because it sounds and looks like human discourse, but it's being generated by these language models. And I don't want to trivialize this because it's reasonable to point out that even though they generate text or now imagery, video, and sound, uh, and they carry on discourse uh, sounding very human, there is something fairly deep going on, even in these relatively crude probabilistic models. And I don't fully appreciate what's going on, but I'll give you an example. At one point, uh, someone described asking a chatbot to simply reverse a string of random characters. And so it did that, and then, unasked, it said, and here's the Python program to do that. Now that surprised everybody because they weren't anticipating that it would voluntarily, I use that word carefully, offer that particular output. Something deep is going on there but I don't think we fully understand it, and I don't think we know how to predict when it's going to go awry. So we have work to do. Okay, so let me suggest something. There's no chance of our doing okay. that would perhaps you know, curb the activities of AI. We could, have, we could have something like Asimov's rules of robotics, and we have nothing like that. We have no rule that says a machine must obey a person, and we have this notion 
that a machine can obey one person in order to abuse another one That's, or control uh, another one. Of course, there are stories that Asimov has written describing uh, he's you know, around, clever he's describing ways malfunctions of, of, string, a basic, of a basic set of notions, yeah. Yeah. right, that make fun stories. Mm -hmm. But the point is, there is dating back to the invention of the pin tumbler lock in ancient, ancient Egypt. Uh, no objection to a machine having control over a person. There's no rule says when you say something to a machine, it must do that if it possibly can. We, we broadly, if you look around you, lots of the technology that's sprung up in our lifetimes is about controlling people. And the smarter the machines get, the more good they will get at exercising their control. Do you think that rules like that should be promulgated by the companies developing the technology or by government? It's something deeper than that. I mean, I think uh, that it would take a change in human viewpoint to achieve that. The governments would be the instrument of it, but the point is people don't even think this way. Well, even if they did think that way, it's not clear to me that the government, speaking you know, broadly about legislators, uh, have the capacity to make rules that actually might work. I think we have to understand these systems a lot more deeply before we know how to influence their behavior in a reliable way. So at the moment, what happens is that we do everything we can to create, in, to use the concrete example of a large language model, we create them, those models, and then we try to fine tune their behavior by mm -hmm. interacting with them and you may have seen a recent report about a way in which they broke through the training information by telling the chatbot to generate the same word over and over again. I think it was poem. And they had it generate poem 100,000 times and it finally started grabbing its training data and starting to disgorge the training data, which it was supposed to not disclose. So they're still fragile systems. Assume that, that sounds like an ordinary sort of buffer overflow. <laughs> well, yeah, in a, in a very funny sense. I think it may have been literally that. There's, there's this thing uh, called context. And it's an amount of information that the chatbots use in order to generate their output. And when you overflow the available context, I'm guessing that's when you start, in this case, revealing the training data. So that's a good example. I mean, if we, if we had the kind of what I'm envisioning that I think is impossible, right? There would be a follow rule that an AI can't keep secrets from a person. You ask it what its training data are, it has to tell you. Right? And you're saying it's not supposed to disclose its training data. In order, it has a sort of autonomy in which it's allowed to tell people where to go. But Wit, assume that you could come up with the right answer for Western society. What good does that do if other countries in the world don't buy into it? Well, I think the U.S. has shown its attitude on this subject over the last 30 years in a sequence of wars in which it tried to... Now, but seriously, um, the, I have no... I'm not sure I understand your question exactly, but in one sense, I have no objection to cultural imperialism, right? We do things, if we adopt rules, you know, other people may well have to adopt them. Some people have called for a freeze or a moratorium on LLM developments. But don't you think that if we in the UK and the EU do that, that China or Russia or North Korea or Iran might not, and then we're on the losing side of an arms race? Well, there's a deeper issue here, in my view, and that is that calling for a moratorium doesn't do much good. We really need to work with these things to understand how they work and how to manage their behavior. Um, to give you another example, way back, I think it was in the 70s, there was an asylum, or maybe the 60s, there was an asylum. 74. The, uh, Asylum, famous, the Asylum Law Conference to set the rules on biological correct, and genetic. Correct, Correct. And, and that was broadly accepted. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a Oh, I, I don't know. think, I think it's, no. a, I think maybe it was. No. Okay, in one any, of these conferences. In, in so any was. case, I'm pretty sure it was, but okay. in, in any case, the idea there was that the practitioners actually chose to self-limit 
after discussion about the um, genetic modification of uh, material and of genetic material. And uh, that was propagated by the community well before any legislation was introduced. And so I could imagine the technologists looking at this situation with artificial intelligence choosing to not only adopt some kind of constraints but also figure out how to do that. And that's part of the missing link at the moment, is figuring out how you introduce those kind of constraints. Even if the uh, Asimov's laws would not literally work, the concept that uh, Witt is trying to articulate, I think, fits. And that is to say, built-in constraints. So if we learn how to design and build these, these systems with those constraints, that would be a good thing, I think. Do you have a hope that that could be accomplished? Well, actually, there was an attempt to do there was another. If it's a Silomar, it's another meeting held at a Silomar within the last 20 years or so that explicitly modeled itself on the biological meeting, that which and so it gave rise, the main thing it gave rise to, I think, was the notion of the P1 through P4 containment facilities and what you would have to do Very good and example. what things were dangerous That's and what you would have to yes. do in also order to protect true. them. Yeah. Um, and some facilities, there's a facility yeah. on an island off of Long Island because they can yeah. limit the access to the place much better than if it this was in the middle of Cambridge. I, I'm glad that you chose this uh, particular analogy because it, it resonates with me anyway when you think about you're, you're playing with very powerful technologies and you need to be conscious of the fact that you could uh, unleash something that might be quite harmful. So uh, we should call attention to that, which we've just done in this interview. <laughs> to the three people who are going to wash our podcast. Right, right. <laughs> I want to know something. You talked about the machine stops. Yeah. I presume you have read a logic name, Joe. Yes, I have. Okay. Yes, I, have. I mean, that, it yeah. seems to me, for prediction, prediction of our situation is utterly remarkable. For those who are going to be too lazy to read it, can you summarize yes. it? Yes. A logic name, Joe, was written in 1946 by a man writing under the name Murray Leinster. I don't remember his, that's a pen name. And it, it, he imagined the fusion of television and telephone. And the, the result is very much like the web. And people sit on their telephone and call up entertainment and this, that, and the other much. So he foresaw the web. He foresaw the computer security problem. He didn't understand the computer security problem at all. And the logic name Joe, uh, the devices are called logics rather than workstations. The logic name Joe was crazy. <laughs> and it went around and tampered with all of the, all uh, the and they wow. solved the problem ultimately by taking Joe offline and putting him in a basement somewhere. <clears throat> yes, the question is, can we take anything offline anymore? I mean, these systems are becoming increasingly distributed and the artificial intelligence machine learning mechanisms are showing up in our mobiles as well as our laptops and desktops to say nothing of the data centers. And it will be re reproductivity will be the critical thing as it was with the biological issues. So, but I'm still positively excited about what I'm seeing these things are capable of doing in terms of just reinforcing creativity, triggering ideas that you might not otherwise have had some of the hallucination, so to speak, from the large language models is actually stimulating in the sense that you might not have thought of this uh, People who don't hallucinate well enough themselves. <laughs> well, some, some of our researchers are saying that um, it might be interesting to have interactions with these large language models um, just as a way of brainstorming for a while. Not, not to rely on them to produce something, but just to get the juices flowing. That's not a bad notion. So maybe in terms of terminology, just as you called it surfing the internet, now you'll call it tripping AI. <laughs> Wit, I want to go back to your origin story. Okay. Were, were you a puzzle player or what? How did you get into cryptography? In two ways. One is that in the, in the 60s, I, ha I foresaw a world very threatening to individual privacy and thus autonomy. And I had a, I had a rather anti-governmental, anti right? yes. that's okay. a counterculture yeah. viewpoint. Yeah. Right. And so I, I thought, I, I looked at the, I lived, I worked in the same building with the Multics Project, which had a tremendous 
was the, the most important time sharing project ever. And it had a great deal of concern with security. I looked at the situation and I thought, okay, so all these protections on your file, the system programmers or the operators aren't going to not give it to the police when the police demand it. And so I imagined the only thing you could do to protect your own information was to encrypt it. So in the late 60s, I kept, tried to talk a variety of friends who wished I had succeeded into working on cryptography. Uh, because I thought it was the critical thing. I, thought I was working on something I considered and still consider more important, which is the proof of correctness of programs. Um, which is still a very yeah, no, it's, notion. Yeah. It's right. yeah. but I'm very grateful I got rescued by cryptography <laughs> because <laughs> proof of correctness haven't made as much progress and yeah. I wouldn't have made the difference. That's hard. That's hard. <laughs> um, but then in 1972, there was a wonderful accident. So we're on part two of the answer. And um, Larry Roberts, uh, who was funding the, the ARPANET, went up to NSA to see a man named Howard Rosenblum, who was the deputy director for research, with the obvious proposition, hey man, I have a hundred million dollar a year military communications research experiment going on. We ought to think about security. And they can't have disagreed about that, but they seem to have disagreed about secrecy because Robert's part of ARPA didn't, didn't want to fund classified research. Other parts of ARPA did a lot of it, but, but the Information Processing Techniques Office was very open. And Howard Rosenblum didn't want to do anything else. So Roberts goes back to his office in Roslyn, and for the next week or so, you know, he has this great job. His principal investigators come by with their hats in their hands and have to talk about whatever he wants to talk about. So next week he's talking about network security, which at the time all of us viewed as basically a matter of cryptography. We would see it, we would see it differently now because the cryptographers have largely solved their problem and the, the rest of it's a complete mess. But <laughs> you disagree? No, no, you, no guys I'm not made, you guys have made. You, you guys, you know, you, you, you're encrypted if it goes off the black plane and such. You do some good things with it. But um, so one of the people who went by to see, one of the PIs who went by to see him was my boss, John McCarthy. And McCarthy got the bug and came back out to the laboratory and talked to us about about network security, which we saw as cryptography. Yeah. And a few people got interested, but. Um, Hans, basically, Hans Moravec and I did the most on it. And Hans Moravec uh, wrote, John McCarthy had designed a cryptographic program and Moravec coded it for him. But Moravec added what would later be called key escrow. Because he figured if his thesis advisor wanted to encrypt something, maybe he would be interested in it. So, um, <laughs> And he wrote a, the, the program is what later came to be called, the, the cryptograph system is now called a shrinking generator. It was rediscovered at IBM a few years later. Um, I started working on it, and I operate in a very different way, and I basically set out to, re, set out to read David Kahn's uh, history of cryptography. And I also you know, wrote programs and things like that. But the basic thing I, I was trying to understand was what the requirements for a cryptographic system mm -hmm. were. And by March of 73, uh, I was doing nothing else. And John McCarthy was fed up to his back teeth yeah. because I was being supported by under the table money from NSA to work on proof of correctness. So this was at Stanford. This was at specific, Stanford AI right. Lab before yeah. I met you. Yes. So in March 73, we, we amicably parted company. Truly amicably. I mean, this week we evolved a lot later. And I went off intending to travel around the world uh, and thinking about this problem and talking to people I could find who would talk about it and digging up rare manuscript. And that got as far as New Jersey, where I met, <laughs> where I met my wife. And we then traveled together uh, for a couple of years. Uh, until I was, uh, I went to visit IBM Watson, which had the only good governmental significant cryptographic laboratory in the country. And I talked to Alan Kernheim, who was the head of the math department, which is a lot of this. And he said, I can't tell you anything. We're under a secrecy order here. He only told me one thing, and then he wished he hadn't told me that. He said, go look up my old friend Marty Hellerwood when you get back out to San Yeah, I didn't know about that connection. What is the patent called? 
Diffie, Hellman, and Kripchen? Yeah. Well, exactly. so Hellman and I then immediately, each of us found the other were the best informed person willing to talk about the subject he'd yet found. And we worked together for four years and became a great pain in uh, Allen's ample uh, backside because we, opposed, we, we we raised questions about the system that laboratory designed, data encryption stack. Had anyone been talking about public key encryption before the two of you? Uh, not, not to us. Um, the earliest person I can find who had the idea is, is James Ellis at GCHQ. Right. And his first right. notes are from late 1969. Oh, that early. I, yeah, I, yeah I, the paper's moving. The paper's 1970, but there's some slides. When you're 69. So someone named Cooper at uh, was part of GCHQ, maybe. Who? Named Cooper? Cooper. I don't. Well, have to, we'd have to probably, go. Probably. No, no, I'll go with No, yeah. no. Cox is the, the okay. little words of I, to what Malcolm Williamson uh, developed something that's essentially uh, Diffie Hellman. And Clifford Cox was still alive, uh, developed what's essentially RSA. So those people, those people, it's interesting to me. Uh, they started ahead of us and actually finished af after us. Malcolm mm -hmm. Williams's paper is uh, comes out internally secret paper comes out two months after I gave a talk at the National mm -hmm. Computer Conference about the same scheme. Who, how was public key encryption being used? before it was built into the browser for security? The first use of, it's the first, let me, I'm not sure, the first use I did, the first piece of equipment was made by Erakel Kromsak, I think. And they used, uh, they didn't do it quite the right way, but they roughly used RSA to develop ephemeral keys between uh, between link and groups. This, this actually, if I could uh, interject for a moment, uh, at uh, I was working with NSA starting around 1975 on uh, the problem of using cryptography to encrypt packet communications, and the primary challenge there was that the packets could arrive out of order, and you still needed to decrypt them. So you needed something that's called a message indicator to tell you where in the key stream that particular packet belongs. But we were using uh, cryptographic equipment at that point. Uh, that was essentially intended for link encryption, you know, continuous uh, transmissions. And uh, we had to adapt uh, to that. And as we started poking our way into this, the digital encryption standard, DES, came along, which was designed to do this kind of uh, function. And so we used that to build a packet encryptor in order to study how we could use not public key cryptography, but the DES in a packet mode. But then came the key management, and it was a nightmare because you had to somehow mechanically deliver keying information to all the various uh, parties. BCR incorporates yeah, notion of key yeah, distribution we, we, center. We, we call it Black Crypto Red, BCR program that BBNN ran uh, while I was running it from ARPA and or earlier from, uh, from Stanford. Uh, but then when, when these guys came out with something that you could use to do key distribution that didn't require physical presence, it was a dramatic change for the utility of using cryptographic techniques to protect the information. Was your, apart from intellectual curiosity, was your primary motivation individual privacy? Roughly, yes. I was not doing applied research. I was working on what would much later be called Stu 3, third generation secure telephone. A little bit of difference. There were never more than about half a million Stu 3s. My, my was working to secure all the telephones in North America, which I imagine is say 100 million. And therefore you need approximately the square of that number of keys. And that's sort of the line of thinking. That's a big news. Yeah. Well, okay. And of course now, how many billions of mobiles are there out there? No, I don't know. It's several, there, are several, there are several billion browsers and uh, sure, several billion mobiles. When did you realize that this thing you'd invented would have commercial application on the internet and the I web? Didn't think, I didn't think so much in terms of commercial. I realized immediately. Uh, and you can find an interview with my late wife, Mary Fisher, 
uh, for the RSA series of video interviews. She ca she came home and I said to her, and she in her reference I said to her, I've discovered a great thing. I mean, for the first time in two years of working on this assignment, okay, this is important. So, well, now, you know, the, the paper that you and, and Marty Hellman wrote was called On New Directions in Cryptography. No, on new, new Directions in Cryptography. And, uh, and what was exciting to me about that, that's 1976. And this is just as we're getting the TCP IP protocols sorted out. We're still in the process of going through iterations and trying to get it to work. But it was very clear when that paper showed up that it was going to have a significant role to play in securing the system. And some people have said, well, why didn't you put all that stuff in right away? And part of the answer to that is that in order to manage the keys, uh, you'd have to rely on the behavior of graduate students because they were the ones doing most of the work on the internet. Graduate students get distracted by term papers, final exams, and getting their theses written. And so I thought, well, maybe like watch it all. <laughs> so, so we thought, why don't we wait? Because it was clear we could retrofit that into the architecture, which we in fact have done, as you mentioned. Well, I think we're just incredibly lucky that you didn't have the machinery to make a secure network then, because it would have become what Paul Barron envisioned a national command and control network. Uh, it could not. It, the openness of the internet is the thing that has made it a great economic and cultural force. If it had the power to keep people out, it would roughly be keep the startups out. Has the openness of the internet put us in a position now where the security risks are so great that we need to redesign it from ground zero? Well, I have another place I have an unorthodox opinion. I think the security risks are a function of the fact that the big powers, not NSA, but you and Apple and Microsoft and, and other people, don't want secure. Oh, because if the network was secure, if, if, if individuals had security, then the companies would not have the degree of control over them that they want. And let me give you a perfectly simple example. I think you can reasonably say that, let's say, a parent who wants, if you, if you buy the notion that parents have the right to control what their children see, then they ought to have the right to look at a movie and record it and then show what they recorded to the children. Oh, but Hollywood doesn't want that. It wants to charge you to see the movie every single time you see it, or maybe allow you to see it, or maybe no. Actually, actually, no. And now here I have to differ with you on several points. That's what makes it easy. First observation is that Netflix lets you see a movie as many times as you bought, as long as you pay a fixed fee to subscribe to but, whatever it's got. So that's the first point. Yeah. Second, you know... They but used, they don't, but they try to keep you from recording. Actually, oddly enough, they used to send DVDs out. I know. We were ripping those, and they didn't do that anymore because it was getting expensive to ship through the mail, and they had a decreasing subscriber base for that particular delivery. Yes, there is screaming and yelling about about uh, recording, although we know that people can do that. But the, the argument about Google and others is not wanting cryptography. We actually, oh no, I didn't say you didn't want cryptography. I said you didn't want the users to have security. Actually, that's a different thing. No, that's not true either. Uh, at least some of our product line in, in the. You want them to have a certain cloud. kind of security. Well, the Google Cloud products actually have mechanisms in them to allow our customers to use their own key variables that we have no uh, knowledge of at all. So they can encrypt their data, they can encrypt their software, and they can run that. Okay, who's, who's not here? There's nobody from Apple, nobody from Microsoft. They must be the bad guys. No, no, but I, I should have probably had a disclaimer at the beginning. Vint is here as Vint Cerf, not as a Google representative. So, I, no, no, but, but yeah, you know. He's right. It's impossible to you know, separate me from. And it's also good executive. because it's, if you say no, we do. We Google has such and such. You know much more about what Google has than I do. That's important. So that, but, that, is, but, that isn't being their stooge. But but on the core issue, your view is the internet is secure, no. or you no, think no, it? No, you think it isn't, but no. you blame it on quote unquote big well, tech. I'm in a lack of enthusiasm for what I think of as real security 
which puts vastly more control in the hands of individual users. So, so okay. So then here's where. And so I see, I don't really believe, sometimes I don't believe this. As I say, almost no individual users have the energy and erudition to manage such control. So, so here's where we might differ. I think, uh, or we might differ. Um, I, <laughs> my, my too, I know, bad pun. Oh. He comes from a long line of punters. We have to say, if you if you Google well, Bennett, I was, I was right, dear Vin, D E R. Exactly. If you Google Bennett Surf, a distant, legendary relative of Vince, he was one of the great masters of the pun in American history. Any books in my library written by Bennett Surf? The point I want to make is that I, a lot of what you were talking about is related to privacy, which I think is a very legitimate concern. Security and the use of cryptography is a great concern at Google and many of the other providers as well. Because if they don't find a way to secure the system so that their consumers and customers feel that their data is safe, um, that's a big problem. So we were the ones who pushed very hard to insist on HTTPS, for example. We pushed very hard for DMSSEC. Uh, and we pushed very hard after 2010, especially, to fully encrypt everything that's in our data centers. So all of it, if, even if the data centers are breached, data is already encrypted. So, so we do uh, consider, and I, I personally consider that cryptography is a, our friend here in many different dimensions. We could probably argue about privacy. One of the things that we've just recently done is to try to get rid of third-party cookies for in precisely to improve privacy. I've been shut up. <laughs> no, well, I don't, I don't, it, anyway, we, we don't need to have a huge argument. Well, we should probably figure out what it was that you skipped over to get to the... Oh, uh, must know. he sent us all those questions. No, I, wa I want to talk to you about truth. One could argue that the internet has undermined the concept of truth, especially in recent years, given its role in disinformation. Is that something that you foresaw? Do you think there's any solution to it, or is it just something we have to live with? It, it just, I would like to hear what Witt has to say about that, but I would like to interject something. You, the way you phrased that, you said it's the internet that is responsible for misinformation and disinformation. I beg to differ. When you say internet, I think of the road system that connects the computers together. You're thinking about what people are doing. And it's the people that are causing the problem. And in some cases, it's the technology that helps them do that. So the amplification of social media, the misinformation and disinformation that can be generated with large language models and machine learning, are all mechanisms that people ex you know, uh, exercise. And so I would appreciate it if you didn't just blame the internet for everything and forget about the fact that people have some control over what they use it for. Of course, you're like, okay. So I think one effect of the web more than the internet so to speak, is disintermediation would be the jargon in information flows. So the critical, the critical uh, control of the flow of information was, ed, it was, ex, was exercised in the 19th and much of the 20th centuries by editors. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get something out to a million people unless I could persuade the editors of the New York Times to publish it. Today, I, I, I have many avenues and I might very well succeed, succeed as you may succeed with this podcast, in getting it to go to a million people. And there is nobody with the same education, investment in job, investment in society, as the editor of New York, the New York Times, having it fact-checked and preventing it so, from going so out. I'd like to reinforce what we are saying in the following sense. The other major media had a similar characteristic. You had the ability to reach a large number of people that infrastructure. In the case of newspapers, it was being able to print and distribute paper, but that's also true for radio and for television. You had significant infrastructure required and 
and your access to it was very limited. Only people who controlled the television transmitters or the radio transmitters or the printing presses had the ability to reach uh, this large scale audience. The internet dropped the barrier to access and the social media simply enhanced the potential for reaching large numbers of people. So I'm, I'm in agreement that that's, well, we thought it was a good thing. We thought that dropping the barriers to access to information and the ability to share it would be a beneficial outcome, have a beneficial outcome. And it has had a beneficial outcome. Think of the things that you can find that you otherwise wouldn't be able to find very conveniently by just sitting down yeah, and searching. That's a truly wonderful feature of the modern world. So, but the side effect is that the by the, the same tools have allowed people to distribute misinformation and disinformation and to make matters worse. The latest version of machine learning, the large language models, hallucinate and generate their own misinformation. Well, I think there are natural tendencies to bad flows of information among people. I think it's very easy that if somebody tells you something and you, it sounds believable enough and you repeat it without checking on it. That's something I believe probably everybody does. I have done it many times. And the point now, we, if you t apply an amplifier to that, yes, yes. then you get the chance to get misinformation, which can be, can be innocent or malicious. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, with, with, right on target. Can I give you an example of something? that I, This has to do with trust. You were asking about truth. I want to talk a, a moment about trust. Some of the indicators that we have historically used to decide we should trust this piece of information uh, have become distorted. Here's my, one of my best examples of this, is a reporter who had an interaction with the chatbot in text and decides he wants to make a podcast out of it. So he takes his prompts, his queries, to the chatbot and he reads them in his voice. Then he takes the text coming from the chatbot and translates it through a text-to-speech system, but he's able to choose the voice that is used. And the voice he chose is David Attenborough. <laughs> so now we have the problem of this reporter interacting with what sounds like David Attenborough. And if any of you know what he, you know, I mean, he's well-regarded. Yeah. He has this polished Oxford accent. Anything said in the voice of David Attenborough is Sounds apparently... Sounds yeah, well. Okay, so I'm thinking, okay, well, now we have a problem. What, what should I use to, as indicators to trust information? But I wanted to, to offer with a, another older example of this mm -hmm. that didn't occur to me until I saw this uh, exchange with the uh, reporter. And I'm looking back at Xerox Park. Look, think about 1974 or 75, yeah. so what did they have? Well, they had the Alto workstation, $50,000 workstation. Everybody had one. They had the Ethernet that Bob Metcalf and David Boggs invented, three megabit system at a time when 1200 baud was fast, right? They had bitmap graphics. They had the Bravo word editor. And they had a laser printer. OK, so just imagine they were sitting there in 1973 or 74. They're living 20 years in the future. What happens? You prepare first draft material, and you print it on the laser printer, right. left and right justified, beautiful font, you know, choice. Right. It looks like it's final draft stuff. Well, the indicators of effort have gone into it are wrong in this case yeah. because the thing yeah, is that's a very so we've confused. We need we need new indicators that tell us whether we should trust stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, it looked as though the, the, the investment had been put in it that's put into producing a printed article or a published book. And of course, no, it was just some... some and, it was I a mean, shopping list. I predicted right? something hasn't come true yet 40, 50, 40, 50 years ago, which I, I thought by now an individual working alone would be able to produce a color movie of the quality that we had back then. Right? So I'm thinking, you know, it's all going to go to the authors. If you have the, the brilliance to produce 
I don't know, sound of music, if you can think it all up, then you can use your tools just to produce it in a day or two's work in your studio, and you don't need a cast of a thousand, we're actually, et cetera. We're getting close we're getting, to we're, we're, we're getting No, I didn't say it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. I just, you know. Yeah. I, um, on the other hand, I was right in thinking by this point we'd have roughly gigabit connections between any two people Which who want. true. Now that's, yep. right. But the point is, once you... The, that we are moving in this direction of more and more stuff that you can't judge is you can't judge the truth of right. the trustworthiness but of by by what would at one time have been the cost of producing it. Yes, this is it, actually very important, and so that says provenance has become a more significant uh, uh, element in in deter determining trust. Also, corroborating evidence or other kinds of mechanisms that help us judge whether we should trust the information yeah. or not. That's and AIs ought to be the right tool for that, but they are operating in an entirely different way. Yeah, I, I, I think that that statement alone is should be one of the north stars of our work in artificial intelligence, which is to use the tool to help us judge the trustworthiness of the information that we're getting. You need something on both the supply side and the demand side. So you may be able to use the AI tools to give you information on provenance, but you still need the consumer to care about it and look at it. And, and there's a whole separate question yes. about whether people want that or they just want to be in the echo chamber. Well, I don't even think it's an echo chamber. It's the thing that Whit described earlier about the willingness to forward things to other people without having taken the responsibility for deciding or checking to see whether it's valid. There's this website called Snopes, uh, yeah. which, which uh, has uh, a lot of debunking deep, stuff. Deep, debunks a whole lot of assertions like the post office is going to charge two cents for every email and things like that. Uh, but a lot of people don't take the time. I mean, I'm guilty of this. Just like well, you, you, yes, we we spend enough of our time. <laughs> you know, we have a little. If if you if you if you have, I think a serious point here. If you can't, so to speak, have things you can trust, then you're going to spend all of your time checking on the veracity yeah. of things. Yeah. Um, and it's a little like forgive a uh, sort of you know high-tech example, it, one of the big important things in, in guaranteeing the correctness of programming is to check values to see that they're the right sort of thing. Yes. If something's supposed yes. to be a tall right. The point is, you, but also, if you do that on every possible module, you're just going to waste a huge amount of time. You need a mechanism for saying, we trust that one. Yes. And we just take the data yes. it sends and yeah. operate on it as though it were what we expect it to be. Otherwise, you will yeah. spend 90% of your time doing wow. useless structure checks you, you on You know things. why this is so damn hard in the network environment? Every time um, a computer on the internet interacts with another computer on the internet, it's probably an event which has never happened in the history of the universe. And the reason for that is that the state of this machine and the state of that machine have never been ever in that state before. Just the, the mere fact that they maybe they downloaded some new software, maybe there's an update, maybe just the content of the machine is different. The result is that you can't predict all the various situations in which these interactions could take place. But what's right that we need to find some way of learning to trust some portions of the software or some portions of the data that we're, that's flying around. Because if we can't do that, how will we ever learn to trust anything again? No. I mean, the reasonable question has been asked, read articles about, you know, is Britannica or Wikipedia more trustworthy? And they both have errors in them, and there are different right. mechanisms yes. by which they might be. But at least you can uh, make corrections in Wikipedia, and it was very hard to make corrections in Britannica. That's right, that's right. Britannica. and that's both good and bad. Yeah. You can't, yeah. it's very hard to make changes in Britannica. <laughs> and so before we turn to mentoring, I think what you two have started to collaborate on is an update of Asimov's rule for robots to vent in with rules for AI, of which at least two of them, maybe they're the same one. One is trust, 
in the second, in, in that you have to flesh that out, but that's the topic. And the second one is provenance and an ability to find out not just what trained the, the model, but what they've included, how they've made decisions in that. So hopefully, maybe during lunch today, the two of you on a, we still have whiteboards, the two of you on a whiteboard will start sketching out these rules of the road. The beautiful blue cloth <laughs> wall. Different room. So, you know, that's a really interesting, hard problem. If, if you say, well, you know, if you knew what the training data was, uh, you ought to be able to figure out whether you could trust the output. And at the moment, um, I don't think that's true. So I have another work example for you. You've heard this one, I think, before. I asked uh, one of the chatbots to do an obituary for me. And uh, I thought that was reasonable because the, you know, the web has lots of obituaries and the bots would have learned that format. And there's stuff on the internet about me, so I thought it should be able to do that. And it did, it produced a, you know, an obituary, 700 words, and it starts out, we're sorry to report Dr. Surf passed away. And then it gave a date, which I found very unsettling. <laughs> and, and then it went on to summarize career and family. Well, it conflated things I did with things other people did, gave me credit for stuff I didn't do, gave other people credit for stuff I did, and then it named family members that I don't think I have. And I remember thinking, how the hell could that happen? And then I realized that when the bots are assembled, they're plucking stuff out of web pages. Now, Witt's um, bio and my bio could very well be on adjacent web pages or on the same web page. And the system that's absorbing all that doesn't know that this piece came from Wits bio and that piece came from mine. And so even well, factual it, it, data could become conflated. I mean, that, that seems to be one I would be able to avoid. But I can easily believe something might go to a source that discusses, you know, a source somewhat like this interview. And, or, and, con, and there will frequently be ambiguities as who's, who's the referent of a pronoun. Okay. Yes. For example. Yes. So you, it's yes. easy. Yes. It's oh, easy working, yes. working conscientiously and honestly in an attempt to get things right out of ordinary sources of information is frequently difficult. Yeah. Wit, I don't mean to intrude on your privacy, but have you had an LLM generated obituary prepared? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> I actually, well, I went as far uh, as, as, as getting John Markoff to ask uh, ChatGPT what the date of my death was, oh, and it gave a very sensible answer. It said he wasn't dead as of the end of, 1920, of 2021. Oh. Uh, okay, that, that, that's, that was, that's, that's the point at which it was trained. And I thought, well, that's a nice, solid, you know, sensible answer. Well, I'm, I, haven't gotten, I haven't gotten a full <laughs> bit. I'm, I'm actually assuming that Katie Hafner will do mine. Because Sorry? Katie Hafner will probably do mine because she's responsible for the geek, Geekiverse uh, at the New York Times for a lot <laughs> of the ob obits. And so she prepares them ahead of time, which yeah, is she's mildly still worried disturbing. Right, no. and then she's John Markoff Sex. Yes. And he used to write a lot of, he wrote, yeah. I think he wrote Jobs a bit. At some point I said to him, have you written mine? He said, no, but I'm getting around to it. <laughs> Tell him no rush. Uh, I, I want to close by asking you for mentoring for the many people watching this. Uh, and first, I want to ask it in an unconventional way. Along the way, what career or life advice did someone give you that you ignored or didn't follow that you wish you had followed? Well, I'm the other way around. Yeah, that's the piece I, I can I think of. It's a piece of piece of advice. Um, Danny Brabro's younger brother, Rusty, said to me when we were 15 or 16, you and I will never go into space. We're not good enough physical specimens to be in the first wave, and we'll be too old for the second wave. Well, now, that seems sensible to me, and, you know, but the fact is, I was a good enough physical specimen. My eyes were incredible. I would probably, I would probably my, the, my fault with my being an astronaut had to do with my study habits and things like that. It's, it's not anything like a research job. It's a job in which you have to be, do what needs to be done at this moment. So maybe I would never have become an astronaut. But I listened. His advice seemed to me reasonable. I listened to it. I didn't set my goal to cure the personality problems that stood between me and astronautics. And so I <laughs> never got to do that. So your takeaway from that is 
Don't ever believe there's anything you can't do. Uh, I think okay. it, I think yeah. much more to have lots of people, oh, this problem is too hard, don't bother to work on that one. Well, you and, know, and, Captain Kirk went up uh, at the age of, what, 90? Yeah, uh, well, in space at 90, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah they might. pretty live. amazing. Was there any advice you oh. didn't follow that you wish you had? Or is it the same thing, advice you? I think actually it's closer to uh, Witt's thing, which is advice I was given that I have taken to heart. Um, and this came from Josh Lutterberg, a Nobel Prize winner uh, from Stanford University uh, in uh, recombinant DNA. And he was on the board of the Corporation for uh, National Research Initiatives that Bob Kahn started in 1986, and I joined Bob that year. And I was working on digital libraries at the time, and I was uh, describing what it was that we had in mind to do to Josh Lederberg. And so I covered the whiteboard with all the aspirations and everything else. And at the end, Josh looks at me and he says, Vin, do something. And, you know, I've taken that to heart. You know, don't just talk about it. Do something. If you were restarting your careers today, what field would you go into? I would study law and work on economics. <laughs> we do have a summer associate program. Wow. Um, no, there, and my answer is based on two things. One, law is one of the two big regulated professions. You mm -hmm. can't really, there's a lot, very little you can do in the direction of law without becoming a lawyer. Uh, it's also true of doctor, but that one doesn't interest me. But the point is by, by being, by, by, so, there's a value to, if you're going to put the time into education, you know, the point in getting a PhD in mathematics or physics, of course it makes your life easier and you do actually learn things in those processes. But having the credential of being a lawyer allows you to do a lot of things. Economics is the just utter disaster. It's the most remarkable field because it's about, it's about a human product that is utterly out of our control. And so, have and, you know some great discoveries are needed in economics, and that's that's one place to go to work. So I have two reactions to what Witt just said. The first one is that the one word in economics which I consider very offensive is externalities, mm -hmm. because what that means is we didn't know how to deal with that, so we're ignoring it. I didn't say that, did I? I know you no, did no. not. No, you did not. And, and I'm not accusing you of having said that, but it comes up a lot in economic discussions. Um, so uh, in, I think if, if, if I were re, you know, uh, aligning my career, knowing what I know now, I would probably want to go into what we might call computational microbiology. Yeah. That's I'm utterly fascinated by how cells work. And I learned, you know, a small amount about this from Bruce Alberts, who's written this gigantic book on the microchemistry of cells. But I used to think a cell was this little bag full of chemicals and they banged into each other and stuff happened. Well, I've now learned that if you look at a cell, it has extraordinary order. It's as complicated as downtown Manhattan. All kinds of things are going on. There's communications that's happening among the organelles and between the cells. It's an absolutely fascinating world. So I think if I yeah. if I were starting over again, I would love to go down that path. So I don't think you should say computational, but yeah, microbiology is one of the great things to work on. Language is still utterly not understood. Right? What seemed an incredibly optimistic situation coming into the 60s with, with Chomsky's discoveries yes, have just yes. basically gone nowhere. And large language models aren't telling us, giving us any great insight uh, into no, how, in no. particular, how people talk. Uh, the problem of gravity is, uh, is totally unsolved in physics. That's Those right. Lots, you know, <laughs> and I explicitly wouldn't, adv I don't particularly advise people to go into cryptography, although the field amazingly keeps being reborn. <laughs> yes. Actually, people do come and they say, what should I study? And uh, I tell them astrophysics. And the reason is very simple. A hundred years ago, plus or minus, we thought we knew pretty much how the universe worked. We just needed to measure the constants more accurately and we could make better predictions. And Einstein comes along in 1905 with his four papers, he blows up physics. 
and then the you know the guys who do uh, uh, what am I thinking of here? The string, string theory, theory probably. String, well, it's before string theory, we just get quantum mechanics, and then quantum, you get quantum electrodynamics, and you get quantum chromodynamics. Then you get the string theory guys who are blowing up the quantum chromodynamics guys, and then what happens? We have these guys looking out at the universe, trying to figure out what's going on. And uh, they all know that the universe is expanding. And they start measuring the expansion rate, which they expect should be slowing down by now after all the universe is you know, 12 billion years old. And, um, and they discover it's accelerating. And so you know, your first reaction is, you know, WTM. And, and they, the, so the question is, why is it accelerating? And the answer is dark energy. What's that? We don't know. But it's 70 percent. Oh, but I do know whether they named it wrong. The last time this notion was popular in the 19th century, yeah. it was called levity. Oh, levity oh. is what pushes things apart. Okay. Gravity is what pulls oh, them together. Amazing. And, okay. and uh, well, I'm, I'm in a campaign to so, get the term so changed we, to levity. So, so here we are. We have 70 percent of the universe is dark energy. And then what, the, the galaxies are, should be flying apart based on our estimates of the mass in the galaxy that's visible. So there must be invisible mass holding it together. What do we call that? Dark matter. What's that? I don't know. 95% of the universe is unknown. 5% is ordinary matter, including antimatter. And so when a kid says, what should I do? I tell him, go into astrophysics. The probability is that you'll get the Nobel Prize for anything you do because we don't know anything. Yeah. And just incidentally, galaxies aren't explained by the fact they have large black holes in the middle of them. No, they no, don't that, move that's at all exactly as though they're right. the solar yeah. systems. In fact, it's now starting to look like there's lots of black holes of varying sundry sizes, but that isn't what's holding the galaxy together. It's this other thing, dark matter. Unless, of course, you subscribe to the theory that the gravitational equations are wrong and that they Oops. require a slight uh, modification. It's called M-O-N-D, I think. I forgot yeah, what something, the something it called. stands for. But it's a slight uh, modification of gravitational theory, which would account for the way things work without requiring dark matter. You've been very gracious to be here today, and I look forward to your publication of the Vent in Wit Rules of AI Safety. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us.